Have you started to feel it yet? What did you do to me? One of horror's golden rules is clear, don't go into the woods alone, and the second, absolutely steer clear of super charming strangers you meet there. In yet another film with Finn Whitrock as a murderous psychopath with a god complex, Don't Move is Netflix's answer to breaking both these rules within 15 minutes. Over the past decade, Netflix has delivered some stellar horror content. Creep and its sequel Creep 2 rank among the best found footage horror films. The Ritual has one of the most terrifying monsters in recent memory. And of course, The Haunting of Hill House by Mike Flanagan will always be a masterpiece. But this does not quite hit the mark for me. Directed by Brian Nett and Adam Schindler. The film stars Yellowstone's Kelsey Asbill as a woman stranded and at the mercy of a sadistic killer who takes sick pleasure in her powerlessness. Produced by horror legend Sam Raimi, Don't Move has a promising setup and a few solid twists, but while it builds plenty of tension, it ultimately lacks staying power. So you'll probably end up feeling much like its lead, exhausted and disengaged. But with Halloween around the corner, you might want to give this one a test run for the weekend. So without wasting another moment, let's discuss us what Don't Move is about. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Don't Move begins with a suicidal protagonist grieving the death of her little son. The film opens with Iris tossing and turning around the bed beside her husband, who is deep in sleep. Restless from the thoughts creeping in on her, she decides to take her car and drive up to the remote wilderness for a hike. Once she hikes up to the top of a cliff, Iris bends down to a memorial and picks up a photo of a little boy. She wipes the dust off his face and begins to weep uncontrollably. After carving initials on a rock beside the memorial, Iris stands at the edge of the cliff and looks down. Down. We're never told exactly how long it's been since Iris' life was shattered by this tragedy, but you can figure out that she lost her young son, Mateo, and ever since, she's been struggling to find a way to keep going. As Iris stands at the edge of the cliff, torn between joining her late son in death and finding a reason to go on, just then, a seemingly kind and handsome stranger named Richard hikes up to the cliff and starts a conversation after sensing her despair and hoping to talk her out of it. At first, Iris just wanted to be left alone. She did not want to talk about Mateo or her grief, but as it turns out, Richard knows a thing or two about loss himself. That shared grief is what makes Iris take Richard seriously, and she begins to see a kindred spirit in this man who's still haunted by the loss of his girlfriend Chloe, in a car crash that led him bedridden for two months, two weeks, and four days. We then learn one day, while hiking on the same trail and reaching the same cliff with her husband and her little boy, Iris asked Mateo to look for sticks to roast marshmallows on. Unfortunately, they didn't keep an eye on Mateo, who somehow got to the edge of the cliff and tumbled down. When Richard understands her pain, it seems like a sign from the universe, a reason for Iris to take the end it all off her to-do list, at least for today, and so she decides to follow him back to her car instead of ending it. Richard and Iris have a brief chat about how the world takes what it wants before saying their goodbyes. As Richard gets into his car, Iris walks around hers, only to find that she was blocked by his car. Now, this is where things start to get weird. Instead of moving his car, Richard gets out of his car with an umbrella in hand and closes in on Iris, who's now getting uncomfortable. Before she could even say a word, Richard tases her with the umbrella and drags her to his car. Soon, Iris finds herself tied up in the back seat of Richard's car. Realizing the horrifying truth, this charming stranger, who seemed to care about her grief, didn't stop her from ending her life out of kindness. He just wanted to be the one to do it. Luckily, Richard missed the pocket knife in her pocket, and Iris managed to free herself, attack him, and cause the car to crash. But of course, in such films, escape is never so easy. Richard enjoys her bravado before breaking the bad news news. This man has a fail-safe plan. So even before tying her up, he injected Iris with a special relaxant that takes about 15 minutes to kick in. Once the paralytic drug kicks in, Iris would have roughly 20 minutes before her body completely shuts down. But then, the shutdown will happen in phases, with her first losing her speech, her ability to think straight, the function of her hands, and ultimately the mobility of her legs. Richard kills a sweet old man trying to help Iris. As you must have realized by now, this isn't Richard's first rodeo. In fact, he's a seasoned serial killer with a remote cabin where he brings his victims after paralyzing them. Given we don't know much about his background, there's no way to tell how Richard gets his hands on the special relaxant that he uses on his victims. But judging by how precisely he can tell Iris when each muscle will fail her, it's quite clear that he's done his homework on more than a few victims. Now, even if Iris slashes her knife at Richard, he knows she can't make it out of the woods before 
before the drug finally kicks in. Still determined to buy herself any time she can, she sets a timer on her watch and runs for her life. This is a classic chase scene. When her legs begin to fail her, she hides underneath a hole, but the killer catches up to her. So somehow, Iris drags herself to the edge of a river and lets the stream float her away, putting some distance between her and Richard. She eventually washes up in the yard of an old man named William, and by now she was completely paralyzed. William quickly picks up on her distress, and together they establish a blink-based communication system. Sensing that she was in real trouble, William brings her inside on a wheelbarrow, and just as he's about to call the cops, Richard shows up at his door. When he looks at Iris, William notices that she's blinking multiple times to alert him to not open the door. But still, William opens the door to Richard, frantically asking for help. Even though he asked Richard to wait at the door, the psychopath followed William inside while he was about to call the cops. To distract him, Richard started spinning a story about Iris being his unstable wife, explaining that he was only trying to prevent her from getting committed to some mental hospital. Now, William isn't easily fooled, but Richard's crocodile tears hit a nerve. Having lost his own wife recently to a heart attack, William could not help but feel a pang of sympathy for this devoted husband, who claimed he was just trying to protect his troubled spouse. Well, Richard surely knows how to manipulate people with a painful loss. William was able to give Iris away, and even accepted that he was not being entirely straight with Richard, but the killer's act fell apart when his phone rang suddenly. Richard had told William before before that he lost his phone, which was all the hint the old man needed to understand that this killer was a dangerous man. At first, William threatens to call the cops if Richard doesn't leave, and when that doesn't work, he tries to mislead the man by bluffing that Iris was outside in the shed. But Richard is clearly not an idiot, so William tries to call the cops to his defense. When things escalate, William, who's surprisingly strong for his age, proves he's more than ready to put up a fight. For a moment, it seems like William might even have the upper hand, but Richard manages to grab a knife and fatally stab him. Now he has to cover his tracks, so Richard douses the place in gasoline and starts to burn everything down without even realizing Iris is still inside. Now, before getting to the door, William hid Iris underneath the couch, and she witnessed the entire exchange between them helplessly. As she watched William's body burn, Iris was faced with two grim choices, to stay and burn to death, or take her chances escaping back into Richard's reach. The effects of the paralytic agent had also started to wear off in her fingers, but she still could not move much, leaving her dependent on the very man who wanted to kill her to escape the burning cabin. It was really a close call because Richard was already in William's truck, ready to make his getaway. But rather than facing the flames, Iris takes a risk and moves the blinds to signal to him that she was still there. It turns out she made the right choice, because Richard is too self-absorbed to let a fire intended for someone else take the credit for his kill. So for now at least, Iris was safe. Richard also kills a policeman. So, Don't Move aims to remind us that a man can be dangerous no matter how charming he seems. As Richard drives the truck with the paralyzed Iris in the passenger seat, he keeps getting calls from his daughter and wife. After picking it up, it's revealed that he has a whole life beyond his chilling serial killing side hustle. Richard's daughter was eager to tell him about her flawless report card, and from his conversation with his wife, it's clear that he's manipulated her into believing that his innocent weekend trips to the cabin are just what he needs, in order for him to be the husband she wants. Once. Richard's family has no clue what he does during his alone time in the cabin, but now that his wife wants to visit, he has to think on his feet. While they stop for gas and Richard goes in to get some cash, Iris musters all her strength to try to unbuckle her seatbelt, hoping for a chance to escape and call for help. Unfortunately, luck isn't on her side. Even if a child comes up to her, he's dragged away by his mother, who senses that something was off. Iris is utterly helpless, as Richard drives her back to the scene of the car crash from earlier. He gets out of the car and goes up to his beat-up vehicle to fetch some of his stuff, before changing into a fresh set of clothes. As Richard tries to fix his car, a cop arrives on the scene. You might be wondering who called the police about Richard's truck. I suspect it was the woman at the gas station whose little boy was staring at Iris. But Richard has a whole arsenal of lies ready for the officer. And while the cop isn't completely convinced, he still underestimates Richard enough not to restrain him during the questioning. This gives Richard an easy opportunity to do what he does best and kill the cop. So once again, Iris finds herself at the mercy of this dangerous killer. How does Don't Move in? As Richard drives Iris toward the nearby lake, she desperately tries to reason with him by mentioning his daughter. However, she makes the mistake of implying that he's broken, which doesn't sit well with him. Their strange back and forth conversation reveals some surprising insights. While it initially seemed like Richard was traumatized by the accidental death of his girlfriend Chloe, leading to a fractured mind, that's actually not the truth at all. Chloe's death didn't shatter him, instead it unleashed his darkness. He must have always had sociopathic tendencies, but watching Chloe die that 
that day made him feel powerful, almost like a god, capable of ending lives at will. Since then, he had been chasing that same feeling with every woman he abducted and killed. He wanted them to experience the same helplessness he felt when he was bedridden for two months, and in their final moments, he took pleasure in watching the light fade from their eyes as he ended their lives. The pacing of Don't Move will have you questioning why Richard is taking so many risks and delaying the kill. The answer lies in something he mentions repeatedly throughout the film, that he enjoys spending time with his victims before he kills them. While his encounter with Iris didn't follow the usual pattern, he still wanted to prolong the experience as much as possible. Perhaps it gave him a sense of power, as Richard was savoring Iris's helplessness as he gets her into the boat, preparing to drown her. Something shifts in Iris. What began as a journey toward wanting to end her own life transforms into a newfound appreciation for it. When they first talked, Iris admitted to Richard that she hadn't been able to cry since Mateo's death. Now, on the boat, she only cries to manipulate him, wanting him to believe he's had a significant impact on her. Richard's need for validation softens him just enough for Iris to pull out her next trick, as she begs him for the little toy boat that belonged to Mateo. And in his arrogance, Richard fails to notice she has regained her mobility. So Iris plunges a knife into Richard's throat and shoots him with the gun he took from the copy killed. Plus, when the boat starts sinking, Iris swims to the surface and makes her way to the dock. By the end of Don't Move, Iris had a transformative experience. Perhaps she needed to undergo something devastating to find a way to forgive herself for Mateo's death, and this experience helped her understand the difference between an accident and murder. Richard only tried to talk her out of taking her own life because he wanted to do it himself. Meanwhile, Richard manages to make it to shore too, but given that he's choking on his blood, it's unlikely he'd survive. Since Richard is the catalyst for Iris's breakthrough, it makes sense that her final words to him are thank you. This isn't just gratitude, it's also her way of dismantling his god complex before he dies. When Chloe was taking her last breaths, Richard thanked her for unleashing his darkness, and by saying the same to him, Iris ensures he dies knowing he's just an insignificant man. So that was it for this movie, but what are your thoughts about Don't Move? Let us know in the comments below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone!